Thanks to everyone for joining us today for Tiger Tuesday. Our guest today is Dr. Paul Adams. He is, I'm going to read this from the screen because there's no way I can remember it all. He is the Anschutz Professor of Education and Professor of Physics, as well as the Dean of the College of Education and a former Presidential Distinguished Scholar. So it is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Adams to join us here today. Um, as we often do, we'd like to hear a little bit about your Fort Hayes story. Tell us what brought you to Hayes, what's kept you here, that kind of thing. Okay, so um, I originally came to Hayes right out of my master's degree in physics and um, kind of a little bit of a fluke as a friend of mine, one of my uh, colleagues there, he said, hey, look at this place out in Kansas. They're looking for somebody. I said, okay, I'll apply. And I did, and I ended up in Fort Hayes back in 1986 as my first year. And when I came here, Dr. Morris Witten was uh, gracious enough to take me under his wing. And again, some people may still remember him, but took me under his wing and became my mentor for the three years that I was here as an instructor in the physics department. Um, an interesting thing about <clears throat> that time is that when I, my last year at Fort Hayes in that first stint was the first year of Ed Hammond. So I can say I predate Ed and, and though he's been here a long time and longer than I ever have been, but I can honestly say that uh, I remember when he came in as a rookie president. Well, after that, <clears throat> excuse me, in 89, um, I went on to another institution to work and also go get my, uh, PhD in science education at Purdue University. And then when I finished, um, Morris Witten and then also Luke Kaplan contacted me and said, Paul, why don't you come back to Fort Hayes? It's a great place. And with Morris at that time, one of the things that he and I had talked about back in the 80s was putting together a science center or something like that. Said, so Paul, come back and we can work on that. And so in 96, I came back here with my family and was in the physics department and then took the distinguished professorship over in education to work there and then eventually as a dean. Um, the interesting thing, it, it, for me at least, on that is that I, I really feel committed to Fort Hayes and part of it, uh, though I had a couple opportunities to leave, but I stayed here. And at this point, we officially, with the this year's commencement, have five degrees that my family has earned at Fort Hayes. My wife is uh, Cheryl has her EDS and her master's degree from Fort Hayes. And then my daughter, Megan, has her bachelor's and master's. And my son, David, his bachelor's um, that comes up for him. But then I have two in progress somewhere, um, Eric and Aaron. One is a music major, one is a history major. But we expect eventually to add up to a total of seven degrees from here. So for us, uh, Fort Hayes is very much uh, part of our family and part of our life. And, you know, part of what's kept me here is the fact that at Fort Hayes, you can be creative, you can be entrepreneurial. And um, that probably has been the biggest driver of why I've stayed here and have uh, passed on opportunities to leave in the, in the past. And I think that'll do it, right? <laughs> that is lovely. We love hearing your story. So thank you for sharing that with us. So um, we know that typically this time of the year, although I don't believe that was in one of the titles that I read off for you, you're also oh. deeply involved with the Science Math and Education Institute. Right. And typically this is science camp time of the year. What's right. going on with that? Well, you know, the, the, and this comes back to one of the things I've done and we've been able to build a Science Math Education Institute. And I, I will give, I gotta give my, former president, many presidents ago now, uh, saying, that, uh, I said, Paul, you know, I had an offer to go to another institution, and I said, I can run a science and math center, and uh, President Hammond at that time said, Paul, you don't have to go anywhere. You can do it here. You can do anything here, which is pretty much true. We're very entrepreneurial, and so I said, okay, I'll stay, and we build it up, but one of the things we did build up is we built up a series of summer programs because we identified that at that time, there were no science or STEM camps anywhere in our community. Uh, there was art enrichment, uh, Sternberg wasn't running their programs, CAMS hadn't come on board yet. And so we said, we'll do this. We'll start with a girls uh, math science camp uh, over a decade ago. And from that point, we grew into uh, the month of June where we offer programs targeting 
the um, elementary grade students because CAMS kind of picks up the high school and Sternberg does too. So usually we're very subscribed to that. We have a lot of things uh, that we've done, but this year with the disruption that I don't have to explain, all of you know there's a disruption, uh, is that we've gone to doing some online camp programs. Uh, the beginning of June, we had one of our uh, people that was going to run a camp. She did a series of Facebook uh, live programs that she made that we were able to do and record uh, with a week of STEM activities based around what she was doing, which was really focusing on engineering and engineering ideas. And then our maker van and makerspace people, which I can talk a little bit more about it, but typically they would be busy out doing planetarium programs, helping with the shows and traveling everywhere around the state with library programs helping out haven't and so we said our decision was with the uh, SMEI was say tell you what let's do a series about twice a week we're going to put up STEM activities or STEM experiences that people can do and so we've gotten started on that uh, actually like I said been busy the first week we've had things like how to build your roller coaster well, you got to do that because you're not going to the amusement park. So you can build one at home. And if you could put yourself on a marble, it'd be a great ride. But anyway, we can do that. Our balloon rockets kind of celebrated, you know, the uh, big commercial flight that NASA had. Um, those that are more into some things, we built boomerangs. Um, how to get involved in astronomy with citizen science. And just uh, before this, the first, it just came up today on the 23rd, we had tornado in a bottle which I found to be kind of interesting looking at little cows spinning around in a bottle. So if you go to the FHU Makerspace webpage, you can look at little cows. It kind of reminded me of that movie uh, Twister, you know, with, oh, anyway, we won't go into that and it had there. But then um, we've got a hovercraft building, um, cleaning a penny with a Coke bottle, kinetic stand, plate tectonics, and a series of astronomy programs, which you know, I could, I could elaborate on those, I guess I will elaborate on since I mentioned them, is that, um, anyway, so we've covered our camps by providing kids opportunities to do things, but the other thing that we had to take uh, a little bit of a backseat on was our science cafe, which also comes out of SMEI, and this uh, year we reached our 100th, we're uh, actually beyond 100, uh, but we had to cancel back in um, March because things started to go disruptive and then April we weren't able to do our thing. So we're putting together a summer series on astronomy because usually our planetarium is out everywhere and I know Gigi Launchball, our uh, uh, man that runs the maker van and maker space, it had something like something like uh, 50 engagements to take our planetarium around and do STEM activities. Uh, so we're putting something on. So if you're really into astronomy, you can go to the Makerspace to see a link or to our Science Cafe webpage. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking about how to find the Spider God constellation, which you all know about, or maybe not, where Maui's hook is, or maybe not, but also just how to find your way to uh, the, some of the major summer constellations, like the summer triangle that has, you know, Cygnus and the Lyra and then uh, Altair. And if all these terms are just Greek to you, well, they are Greek, so there you go. Uh, but you can do it. But uh, we just finished one that will be posted up here in a couple days on Hercules, Northern Crown, and the Spider God. So the Spider God is kind of fun. And, and anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, Charlene. I could tell you about the Spider God if you want, but we'll save that to the end. Well, and I do want to remind folks that if you have questions, feel free to chat them to us, or at the end, we will open this up so that anyone who has questions can, um, you know, ask them directly to Dr. Adams. But did I hear you say Maui Hook, like from, Fro uh, not Frozen, but the other Disney movie? Yeah, actually, yeah, Moana. yeah I got to say, Disney stole all their characters from the uh, sky, astronomy, you know, anyway, but Maui's Hook, um, is the Hawaiian legend, but it's the constellation Scorpio. So those people who know, and if you don't, come back and watch my program and you'll find all about it. But it, the Scorpio kind of, I can't draw it very well, but it kind of comes down in a little shape because it's a scorpion's tail getting ready to um, kill Orion. You know, that's a whole nother story there. But in the um, Hawaiian islands, they identified because it comes down and curls around, they called it Maui's hook. And the legend is, is that 
he was fishing, threw it down into the uh, earth that got hooked and pulled it up and in the process pulled up all the Hawaiian islands. So it's not only a constellation, it's part of a creation myth that, uh, that is done with that. And the spider god, just for those who don't know, is a Blackfoot um, uh, legend about a giant spider in the sky, which is tied to Northern Crown, and it will climb down the Milky Way at night and do what spiders do, which is hunting. And, you know, if you know people out at night, say, look, the giant spider's out looking for it. And we'll stop there. I used to tell these to Boy Scouts and keep them in their tent at night from the giant spider. Anyway, we'll, let's go on. We want to keep it, keep it PG, so we'll stop there. <laughs> well, I don't want to think about giant spiders coming after me, that's for sure. <laughs> makes me makes me not want to go camping. Thank you, Dr. Adams, for that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's let's change our focus to the College of Education. Your your other hat, and probably your primary hat these days. Um, yeah. Just yesterday, um, a press release came out talking about the new class that you're offering for about teaching or education in a crisis. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, Chris Yoakum and um, uh, Scott Gregory, two, two of our, Chris, the chair of the Department of Education, and Scott, who is our um, director of field experiences, uh, had been talking about all the things that we experienced uh, from our perspective, the disruption that we heard happening and that we dealt with, uh, with our students who were out student teaching. And I'm glad to say that it came out that our students moved from mentors to colleagues because they had the skills that were needed for schooling to continue with the continuous learning plan. But their experiences of talking with superintendents and principals and teachers realized that, uh, that there was an opportunity here to help uh, lead school leaders by putting on a leading through crisis course. And if you do know some people that are interested in it, it's, it's very good. Um, Scott has been researching it. He's been sitting in on several state committees and looking at what skill set do you need and what sort of um, attributes can help you succeed in a crisis management situation? Um, you know, we can, you know, we have COVID-19, which we know is disruptive and somewhat of a crisis, but there are other crises as well. So it's a new course. It's not a, uh, it's not a standard. It was a course we offered because we have the people with the expertise and we felt that anything we can do to be of service to our, our partners out there in education, we should do so because that's what we do at Fort Hayes is to help others um, succeed. So uh, please share the word on that because it is a very, um, a very timely and very targeted. And I know Scott is uh, Gregory, who will be the lead instructor, has been preparing heavily to give advice, ideas, and look at what this means for uh, public schooling. So, so you mentioned student teachers. Yeah. What was that experience like for them and for those of you who placed them, you know, as things shut down over the spring semester? Well, you know, it was the easiest thing to say is stressful for them. Um, but we were fortunate that we started moving before all the closures because Scott had been paying attention and, be, and because we placed people everywhere in the country, before Kansas shut down, we already had some of our students shutting down schools. For example, in uh, China, where we have a student teacher, they had shut down a couple months before we did. So it gave us some ideas. So what we worked with, with our student teachers to say, look, you have the skills. So in the case of the, uh, the, the student teacher who was in China, he's saying, what can I do to move over? And we said, well, what about Google Classroom? And because he'd had that as part of his curriculum, he was able to make the transition and successfully complete the school year in China, actually starting all the way back in January. You know, we, our problem came up in March, and particularly after spring break, it really came up. So what we reminded our student teachers about is, look, you at this stage are not a mentor-mentee relationship. And we tried to assure them that they're going to be in a different world. And we made some accommodations. We changed the way that we did evaluations so that there was no harm to them. But we encouraged them and, and, um, and particularly spent some extra time with uh, weekly meetings, a couple weekly meetings, talk about things and remind them about the technology and put together through our advanced ed programs a help pitch where if there was a question or a particular need that we could do, we would help you through that if it was social, emotional, technology, whatever it may have been. So we did get them to transition to being a colleague 
And the word that we heard back from many of the cooperating teachers is these folks that we had, our, your, the student teachers we have, have been a, a godsend to us because they know the tech skills, they've had it as part of the Fort Hayes education, and uh, the value of that education really came to a fore in this disruption period. So I, I would say our, our folks did well, and we have a team of faculty and staff who went over and above to make sure that our students in the field were able to achieve what they needed to, but be of service and, and make a difference. So speaking of part of that team, I know that recently uh, there was an announcement about a scholarship that the Stramels have provided. Yeah, um, the Stramel uh, scholarship uh, and Janet Stramel and I, she had had some, we'd had some discussions because we have a, uh, we've had a National Science Foundation grant to work with STEM teachers. And a really big part of that was putting people in uh, cultures and environments they hadn't had. In our case, we're really focused on preparing rural teachers, so we put them out there. And so when Janet and I had that conversation, she said, I wish every student could get this. And, uh, and not just a rural school, but see a different culture. And so she then visited with Chris Yoakum, the department chair, and they decided to develop what we call a, um, a study away uh, program, where it would, uh, money that would be available to help students go experience a different culture, something different than what we did here. So, you know, the initial plan was some of it was being used to help students go down to Costa Rica to experience that international. But some of the other plans that were temporary, have been temporarily put on hold was say, maybe what we look at is maybe we get them to New York City, maybe we get them to Kansas City. We take them to areas that are totally different. So Houston is one of those other areas that we've uh, done some students with travel away that the Stramel Fund is supporting that. And the reason for our study away rather, but the reason for that is that we have a partnership that we work with with the Leaf School District and so we want students to see that. And what we're finding is, you know, we're, we're preparing our students, not just for the job when they leave, but for the job they're gonna have three and five and 10 years down. And so by giving a chance to experience different cultures, it strengthens them and it also enables them wherever they go to bring new outlook and new ideas to serve the communities that they're working in. So you mentioned the Alif partnership. Sure. Can, can you, I think people might be surprised to hear that we have a partnership in Houston, Texas. Can you tell us how that came to be and, and what that partnership entails? Yeah, uh, the partnership came and be because we, we are, um, Department Chair of Teacher Ed had at UNK, we'll, we'll just leave it as an abbreviation, we don't want to talk about anybody else, but uh, they had been recruiting from there to bring students down to Houston because Houston has a problem of finding enough teachers. Uh, but that relationship was established and so the opportunity came and they talked with Chris Yoakum who said, hey, we've got, uh, we, we'd like to recruit from you. Uh, one, you're closer to Houston than that place to the north of you. And uh, you know, you've got a changing demographic here that maybe this would be a benefit to your students. So it started out by um, inviting them to campus to talk to our students about jobs, but also student uh, teaching placements. And that was really kind of an exciting thing for them. And so what we did is we were able to uh, uh, work it up where the students who are gonna go down their student teach are actually paid money to come down there student teach enough to cover their housing all that and they and that's exactly what we do is that they get to go down there they student teach some are offered jobs a few have taken them there but what we often see is they go down there and say you know this is a fantastic experience but I'm going back to Kansas because that's where I feel I belong so it's um, it's been going on now I think we're in our third we'll be going into our third year and we'll send down anywhere from three to five students at a time but uh, they're coming back, coming back enriched. So it's working out well for us and the students. And the students. And the students, so that's, yeah. that is all last, last bit cheaper for them because they get enough money to help cover the student teaching. That's great, that's great. So um, I just wanna remind everyone that if you have questions, feel free to chat them to us or here in just a couple minutes, we'll open it up to everyone else. 
um, you know, the old fashioned way as best we can. So um, I, I know that you were involved with um, CAM since its beginning. We'll probably have another session all about CAMs in general, but can you tell us about the beginnings of that program and, and you know, what your interest was in that? Uh, yeah. Um, and probably even what CAM stands for, because, you know, we okay. use acronyms all the time and maybe we shouldn't. Okay. Well, uh, boy, that, that does go back a ways. But CAMS, uh, Kansas Academy of Mathematics and Science um, was uh, really kind of the brainchild of two gentlemen in uh, Jerry and Jerry, I think, or both of them are, um, but in uh, Kansas City area, and they convinced the legislator to say, let's support the idea of doing a, a advanced program or an opportunity that they had seen in other areas of the state of a program centered on a university that would allow those students who are capable, who are, are really going beyond um, capable of going beyond much more than what their local high school could do. These are the ones who are very driven, very um, uh, bright in the area of STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, could come together in one place to enter into the university early. So you could call it an early entry to university program, but it's not just to come to the university. It's come to the university to become a leader in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So my role in it was, uh, boy, I, oh, you know, there's some questions here I'll let you answer. So my role in it was, uh, at first, I was on the team that wrote the RFP, the request for proposals for the uh, state of Kansas. And then at that point, I had talked with um, President Hammond at that time and Provost Gould at that time and said, I'm going to leave the committee because I want to write the proposal for us to bring CAMS here because I think it's what we can do well. And so I put together a team, Ann Noble was a part of it, um, and actually several other people, Leslie Page was a part, and others that have now left the university. But we put that together, put it in, and we were awarded that, um, awarded the, the opportunity to build the program. Why Fort Hayes? Because they felt that we had the safe environment, and we put together the best package of how the curriculum would take those students who really are into STEM and would move them up the ratchet, uh, ratchet up what they could do and what experience could have, much more so than they could get in their home high schools. And this isn't a criticism of home high schools. It's just that there are those students who are ready to go faster and further and are so um, focused on what they wanna be that this is really where they've come. So I've watched that. I was a part of it. I used to teach a research course on it. And it's interesting, even now, uh, several years later, I still get emails from students said, thank you for what CAMS did. It has made me, uh, a, it has helped me advance my career. It's helped me do well in school. So I'm very proud of what that's done for the university. Well, it is absolutely a great program and one that we should be touting as much as possible because it's, it's so unique and, and so great. So, yeah. yeah. And I guess I did see student teachers. Or just, yeah. Oh, I don't know. You can choose whatever questions you want me to answer. Well, uh, so that was the question I was, I've kind of, I, some of them get private messages to me, so you don't see them all, Paul, but this one is out for everyone. Um, this one is asking about student teachers having, do they have trouble adjusting to a new environment if you have a real Kansas kid going to Houston or, or New York City or wherever, are there any adjustment issues that you're seeing? Or a big um, city kid who comes to Hayes and then goes out to a rural school would be, you know, the opposite sure. of that. Well, and, and I would say in the over, and I guess part of it when I say we're everywhere out in the U.S. and outside the U.S., usually those are individuals who are placed in those areas. I mean, they live there. And so the, the person in China was living there, and they were already teaching at a, um, an accredited school that's recognized by the state of Kansas as being accredited. And so for them, they were there to do it. Um, and in terms of outs in major cities, often again, our, our reach because of our delivery through virtual, or actually through FHSU online, look for the press release and that, but through FHSU online is that our reach is that we have students who live in those cities. Um, but what we did find is it, it is a good question. Do our students have trouble adapting? Sometimes they do, um, but that's where um, Scott Gregory, our field experience person, 
works with them. Gary Anderson, who works with our transition to teaching program, which is maybe a whole other topic, will work with students who are in settings that they maybe never have done. And part of our, our focus on rural schools has been with our um, National Science Foundation grant to put them in settings to build their experiences. So um, the answer is some do, many are already placed there, but part of the stream will um, travel fund that uh, Dr. Stream will put together and her husband Dean Stream will put together was to address that issue by giving our students exposures to different environments so that we could diversify where they go and to help in, in, enhance their success. Very good. So I think that's all the questions that we have through chat. Does anyone else have any, because we're, we're closing in on our 30 minutes here, so do any members of our audience want to unmute themselves and ask a question? All right, I do not see any additional questions. So, and like I said, we are right at the half an hour. So is there anything else that we have not asked you about that you want to share with us? One real quick thing, uh, do go to our uh, Makerspace webpage and look at the summer programs, direct kids to it. There's great stuff there. And if you're into astronomy, look for our Science Cafe series coming up. And the other thing I want to share with you, because many of you may have had to get licenses is that we'll be announcing here uh, that we've been able to take the gifts from alumni that have come as unrestricted scholarships. And right now we're going to be directing them to licensure scholarship. So I just reviewed and we're getting the paperwork done, but we're going to award, they're small, $150, but $150 covers the cost of one test to get licensed. And so this will go to those that are in their student teaching semester when the monies are, are lowest. So I want to thank all alumni who have uh, done that because we were able to take that fund, put it back to the students who are most at need and to address the fact that uh, really to address the fact that we need to uh, keep going. We need teachers uh, and Fort Hayes is a big producer and we want to be sure that when our teachers leave, they have the least amount of debt possible because we know it's not the most lucrative of careers, but it's one of the most important careers. Thank you. Just last call. Anyone else? Oh, we just got a question tweeted or texted to us. Oh, thank you for the, it's not a question. Thank you for the presentation. I was a student of Paul's back in the 80s. It's Chris Jones. Wow. It's been great to be back in That's class, great. says Chris. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Chris, thank you for joining us and thanks to everyone else for joining us. Um, next week, we'll be joined by yet another person from the College of Education, Dr. Beth Walliser. Um, we'll see how many yippee skippies we can get from her throughout the course of our presentation next week. So hopefully we'll see you all again on, on Tuesday of next week. And until then, uh, thanks again to Dr. Adams and all of you for joining us. Thank you. Bye.